just a closer walk with thee. Do you like to go for walks? Do you like to go for walks with someone special, someone you love? And while you're walking, do you find yourself just carrying on conversation? And it just, it just makes the whole event more meaningful. Well, that's where the Lord is and how he wants to walk with us every day in our lives. And so as you go through the day, talk with the Lord. Allow him to talk with you. Impress upon you, your heart, his thoughts, his will, and his way. Heavenly Father, as we gather here to worship you this Sunday morning, Father, we just praise you for the beauty of the sun that is shining this day, and bringing forth the beautiful creation that you have created. Lord, we're reminded just how powerful you are, how you order the seasons, and in the process you order our lives. And Father, we can walk with you each and every day. Father, give us a closer walk with you that we might know you fully and fully be known on this side of glory. Lord, those in our church are going to be facing some medical tests or situations in the week ahead. May your hand be upon them. Lord, great physician, heal them. Help them. Encourage them. Walk with their family members this week as they also share in these times, thinking of their loved one. And, and Lord, we know we can put our hands in you, our trust in you, and into your hands because of how good a Father God you are. Lord, be with us as we worship you this day. Father God, lead our country, even in these days. Lord, Give us cause to see your hand at work. Oh, thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated this morning. It is a joy each week to hear uh, my story from one of our folk at church here. And so today, Catherine Houston is going to come and share her story. So Catherine, we invite you to come, please. And... Uh, just bring glory to the Lord as you share. Catherine is one of our one who ones who works at home, working with Operation Christmas Child, and to date she has put together 400 sewing kits that'll be going to children somewhere around the globe. And she says, "Can I have some more to put together?" So <laughs> we just love her for that. So Catherine, this morning you share what God's put on your heart. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I think some of you have already heard my testimony, but here goes again. <laughs> when I was pretty young, my mother would bring my two brothers and me to church here. I was 12 years old when I accepted Jesus as my Savior. And I was baptized in a farm pond up the road a ways. I continued to go to church, training union, Bible school, until I was married. After I was married, I drifted away from Jesus and the church. During the years of having, raising four kids and a divorce, I took God for granted. He was still an influence in my life, but he was not first like he should have been. Six years after the divorce, I remarried. Jim and I were married <clears throat> for two and a half years during which he got lung cancer and died. And then one day, everything changed. I was driving to one of my son's house, driving too fast, I missed a curve, and went down a steep bank, knocking down a road signs and brush as I went. All of a sudden, I saw a telephone pole right in front of my eyes. It, it was so close, I knew I was going to hit it because I was still going fast. So I closed my eyes. The next thing I know, I'm out of the ditch and on the road. It was right then that I knew that God had taken control of my car and my life. God was telling me to stop taking him for granted and put him first in my life again. The next week, I was back here at Grandview. <laughs> I later rededicated my life to Jesus. There has been many wonderful and very serious and bad things that's happened in my life, 
none of them is as dramatic as that. One of my daughters told me one day, Mom, you sure are having, keeping your guardian angel busy. <laughs> Every day I thank God for the blessings that he has given to me and my family. Amen. Amen. Friends, you can stay seated for your for our resting hymn here. Um, Claire and Callie, if you can hear me, your parents are in here in the sound booth. <laughs> I saw you looking earlier, so just FYI. <laughs> uh, 432 is our next hymn, friends. Uh, Speak, O Lord. This is a, a Getty hymn that's um, in our new hymnals, and it's actually a very, very, very good song. filled with your glory. May it be so, Almighty God. Our message this morning is entitled, Courage to Trust God's Leading, from Numbers chapter 13, and we'll turn to that and read from those verses in just a little bit. There's a pew Bible there next to you, and you're welcome to use it, and it's on page 116 for this passage of Scripture. As we begin this morning, let me ask a question, and, and I'm asking for responses. Um, if you could visit one location here in our country or another country, where would it be? Someone? Israel? I know you've been there a time or ten. 
<laughs> yes. Okay, Israel. Someone else. Somewhere in this country you'd like to visit or somewhere uh, another country? Y'all don't want to go nowhere. <laughs> Ireland. Ireland. I hear the beach. Anywhere. Anywhere. Just to the beach. Anywhere that has a beach or ocean water beach or lake water? Yes. Yes. Just. Yeah. Mary Garrett's favorite color is ocean, and that's my favorite color too. <laughs> that's my favorite color too. <laughs> beach. I'd like to go back to Glacier National Park in Montana. Glacier National Park in Montana. Wow. Yeah. Anyone else? One or two more? I was trying to go to D.C., but now I'm not so sure. Not so sure? Yeah. It's worth it. We were just, you know, there in March, and uh, yeah, it's still worth it. it uh, it's our nation. Yeah. It's going to be our nation. Well, it's the Lord's nation, and we get to participate in it. One more. Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor, yeah. Yeah, the Lord blessed the chance to be there once. Very meaningful. Well, when you go on a trip, do you collect things and bring them back home? I mean, when you go, do you, do you have anything you, you like to get and bring back and add to your collection? Anybody? Faye? Oh, yeah. I, I, I usually have to bring at least one thing back as a memory of the trip. Okay. Is there a specific thing? No, just one thing. Are they kind of eclectic then, different things? Yeah, okay. That's cool. I like that. Someone else? Seashells. Seashells. Yeah, those are hard to find in the Grand Canyon, but you know when <laughs> But if you're down if you're down at the <laughs> down at the beach, postcards. postcards. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Diane and I got into in our years overseas into getting a magnet uh, to every country or every village or town wherever we happened to be. We covered our refrigerator with them. And when we came back stateside, we only had two suitcases each and they, for 50 pounds each. And so we weighed all of those magnets, and they were 15 pounds of magnets. And so we didn't bring them back because we were so limited in how much weight we could bring. So, you know, somebody else is enjoying those magnets. Well, anyway, today, as we turn to Numbers chapter 13, we're going to see where there was a group that was sent on a trip. Um, these 12 spies who go across and in, in, into the land that the Lord has given to the people of Israel as the land of promise. And as they go, they actually bring back some souvenirs from their trip. And we're going to take a look at that. And here's the interesting part. After they got back, no matter the great trip, but 10 of the 12 were very reluctant to return. Courage to trust God's leading. Numbers 13, reading verse 1 through 3 and then uh, verses uh, 17 through 33. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. From each ancestral tribe, send one of its leaders. So the Lord's command, Moses, so at the Lord's command, Moses sent them out from the desert of Paran. All of them were leaders of the Israelites. And then here we have listed down, but we'll begin again in verse 17. There's listed the names of them in between. When Moses sent them to explore Canaan, he said, Go up through the Negev and into the hill country and see what the land is like and, and whether the people who live there are strong or weak, few or many. What kind of land do they live in? Is it good or bad? What kind of towns do they live in? Are they unwalled or fortified? How is the soil? Is it fertile or poor? Are there trees on it or not? Do your best to bring back some of the fruit of the, of the land. It was the season for the first ripe grapes. So they went up and explored the land from the desert of Zin as far as Rehob toward Libo Hamath. And they went up through the Negev and came to Hebron where... Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, lived. Hebron had been built seven years before Zoan in Egypt. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, Eshkol means cluster, like a cluster of grapes. When they reached the valley of Eshkol, they cut off a branch bearing a single cluster of grapes. Two of them carried it on a pole between them. It, can you imagine? What a, what a cluster of grapes that it took two people with a pole to carry this one cluster of grapes. They also brought pomegranates and figs. 
Verse 24, that place was called the Valley of Eshcol because of the cluster of grapes the Israelites cut off there. At the end of 40 days, they returned from exploring the land. They came back to Moses and Aaron and the whole Israelite community at Kadesh in the desert of Paran. And there they reported to them and to the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. That must have been quite a moment. You know, they're carrying this through the crowd and everybody's seeing what the land of promise has to offer. And they're, you know, I can imagine the excitement that's building and saying, look, look what's laying before us. Verse 27, so they gave Moses this account. We went into the land to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here is the fruit. Oh, wow, this is good stuff. Verse 28, but... You ever get in a conversation with somebody and then everything's going along and then they say, but, you know, something's coming, right? <laughs> but the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified, very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev. The Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. And the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. Then Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. Were they passing rumors? I'm, I'm not, what were they doing? Hmm. Verse 32 again. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they had explored. And they said, the land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are great of size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak who come from the Nephilim. And we seemed like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look like the same to them. Trusting God's leading and having courage to do so. This book of Numbers falls within that first five books of the Old Testament that we call the books of the law. They were written by Moses. We have Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. In the book of Genesis, we have the fact that God chooses his people through Abraham, who God called, and Abraham himself then, by faith, trusted the Lord. And the scriptures tell us because of his faith, it was reckoned to him, counted to him, assigned to him as righteousness. It was because of his faith to trust what God was saying. Here's what I want you to do. And Abraham did. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all accounted because of their faith before the Lord. In Genesis, God chooses his people, and by faith his people come forth. In Exodus, God redeems his people, because over the centuries they had found themselves now in Egypt, and God now delivers them, and he brings them forth out of the hands of Pharaoh, out of the land of slavery, and he brings them forth. In Leviticus, God comes alongside his people with the tabernacle, and his presence is with the, his people. It's a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, and they know that the Lord is with them. In Numbers, God calls his people to trust him. And one of the key moments is in chapter 13, where he brings them now out of Egypt, up through the Negev, up through the, the desert, and they come now to the border of the promised land. And the Lord is ready to say, now let's go into the land I'm giving you. I am personally so thankful to be part of this great journey called faith. Very grateful to be involved in this life journey called faith. You know, have you ever heard it said, you know, faith is forsaking all, I trust him. This journey of faith, what a joy it is. And just like this great adventure, every time I'm willing to obey God's leading in my life, I discover more and more of God's power. I discover more and more of his might, his protection, his faithfulness, his provision. If there's anything that my journey of faith has taught me, it's this. Where God guides, God provides. That's just one thing that God has taught me, and I'm, I pray he's teaching has taught you that where God guides, God provides. Have you discovered this? Oh, I pray so. 
Because when I look back over my life, I look through my marriage with Diane and the family that God has blessed us with, as I look back over my walk with Christ, I can see God leading and providing at so many different steps along the way. And one thing, though, that I've discovered is that most times God only gives you the next step. He doesn't give the whole plan. He just says, well, here's the next step. Will you trust me? You see, we know there's something that we can hold on to. Where God guides, God provides. Now, the people of Israel surely must have discovered this truth as well, don't you think? I mean, imagine, while having been enslaved in Egypt for over 400 years, they cried out to God in their misery, praying and calling out for God to deliver them from that land of slavery, to give them a land of their own, and God heard their cry. God heard their cry, and God prepared to lead them out of the bondage in Egypt into the land of freedom, to the land of promise. God sent ten plagues upon the people of Egypt because of Pharaoh's hard-heartedness, his unwillingness to set the people of God free. During the last plague, where God himself had instructed the people of Israel to sacrifice a lamb and to take the blood of the lamb and put it over the doorposts of their homes, so that then when the plague of the death angel came through and the firstborn of those homes without the blood was taken, the life of that child. The death angel then would pass over the homes where the blood had been spilled. You know, that must have been quite a day when Pharaoh set the people of God free. I mean, God did it. But when Pharaoh finally recognized he was up against someone bigger than he was, and he set the people of God free. I mean, that must have been quite a day when all of that began to take place and the people of Israel began to march out of Egypt. The people of Israel were beginning to understand, beginning to discover that where God guides, God provides. A few days later into the journey, Pharaoh changed his mind, didn't he? Pharaoh changed his mind and he sent his army to capture and bring back the Israelites in order to place them back into slavery. God's people were camped on the shore of the Red Sea when they heard the mighty sound of thunder, not knowing what it was until they discovered that it was the mighty sound of the hooves of horses and chariots of Pharaoh's army approaching and cutting off any chance of escape. Many wanted to turn back. Many wanted to surrender. Many wanted to return to Egypt and to slavery, but God spoke and said, Moses, tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea. And then before their eyes, what happened? The Red Sea parted and the people of God moved through and were delivered. And then the Red Sea closed and the people of Pharaoh were taken. The sea parted and God's power was known. Even those who had wanted to turn back we're beginning to recognize where God guides, God provides. Well, not too long after their deliverance, the, the people began to complain. If only we had died in Egypt. At least there we sat around pots of meat and we ate all the food we wanted, but the Lord has brought us to this desert to starve us to death. But God provided manna from heaven. God provided, and they were beginning again to see where God guides, God provides. And then, though, not too long after that, after eating God's miraculous provision of manna every day, the people started to grumble and complain once again, and they wanted to return to Egypt and to slavery. But yet, once again, God in His grace and God in His mercy provided meat in abundance. And by now, you would think they'd be learning that where God guides, God provides, but as the nation of Israel continued their journey of freedom in the desert, they now searched for water. Did they ask God, Lord, who provides the manna, God, who provides the meat, God, who's watched after us all this time, God, would you please, would you give us water to drink here in the desert? No. They complained. They grumbled. Why did you bring us out of Egypt and to put us and our livestock here to die of thirst, they said. But even in their grumbling, God provided water from a rock and 
And the water flowed forth, and it was enough for all. Now surely this was the time Israel began to believe where God guides, God provides, right? But sadly, day after day, situation after situation, the people of God had short memories from God's leading and defeating the Amalekites to the giving of Ten Commandments, from the preparation of the tabernacle to the placement of the Ark of the Covenant in their midst, from God's presence before them as a pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire by night. With all of this going on, you would think the people of Israel were learning where God guides, God provides. But as we've seen in our text, in Numbers chapter 13, there is a major issue that the people, even though they have experienced eyewitness accounts. It was about a year journey from when they came out of Egypt in slavery and then came through the desert and came now to the beginning of going into the promised land. Around a year of journey. During this time, they've seen the, the faithfulness of God again and again and again. But yet when they came up to this moment, they were again thinking about what only they could do instead of what God could do. Oh, the, the uh, Nephilim, they are so tall. The cities are so strong. The, they were looking up against that. And they were only seeing what they thought they can do instead of what God can do. And we asked the question, how could God's redeemed people, who knew the very presence of God, how could they miss the calling of God and become an aimlessly wandering people? Well, that's what we're looking at this morning. Three specific things. First is the circumstance that led to this great disaster of not trusting God. Second, the choice that they made. And third, the consequence of their choice. And so let's consider the circumstance. Now, what again is the circumstance before them? God is leading them to the shores of the Jordan River, and he's getting ready to send them over uh, into the promised land. But the first thing they do is what? They send the 12 spies by God's direction, go into the land, check it out, come back with a report. And the people wait for 40 days. They come back carrying this great fruit, and, and, and they're beginning to see the promise that God has laid out before them. But then 10 of the 12 gave a negative report. And the people had a response. Look in chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. That night all the people of the community raised their voices and wept aloud. And all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. Why is the Lord bringing us to this land only to let us fall by the sword? Our wives and children will be taken as plunder. Wouldn't it be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to each other, we should choose a leader and go back to Egypt. The circumstance is, is that they, they see the promise of what God is offering. They understand what is before them. They have seen the Father's faithfulness all through this past year in their lives. But yet... Again, their focus is only on what they can see and understand and not trusting God. And they develop a bad attitude. I don't know if it was from fear of the unknown or concern over the future, a longing for the comfort of the past. But they had a bad attitude. Someone said, it's difficult to make a good decision with a bad attitude. There's probably some truth in that. Why did they give that response? Why did they give this response instead of receiving what God was saying? Come on! It's a faith issue. Instead of going where God provides and knowing where God guides, God provides, they still, by their own understanding, were not trusting. It was a faith issue. In the New Testament, we read of a place where a centurion comes to Jesus and, and he says, my servant is ill. Would you please just say the word and he'll be healed? Don't need to come to my house. You're under authority like I'm a man of authority. And I, and I just simply say the word and my soldier goes and does this. And Jesus responded by saying, 
It says Jesus was amazed at him and turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. There was a Canaanite woman who came to Jesus, a Gentile like the centurion, and her daughter had been demon possessed and she was pestering Jesus to heal his daughter, to heal her daughter. And again and again asked him of this. And finally Jesus said, woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. But one time Jesus went to his hometown of Nazareth. And while he was in Nazareth, well, the Bible says he could not do any miracles there except to lay his hands on a few sick people and to heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus is never impressed with someone's education. Throughout the New Testament, Jesus is never amazed at, at someone's position. He's only impressed and amazed at one thing. What is it? A person's faith. Their faith to be able to realize and recognize where God guides, God provides. What the people of Israel had allowed themselves was that they had allowed themselves to be robbed of their faith. That's the circumstance. Well, what was the choice? God put a choice before them. The choice was to go into the land or not. Have you ever played this game before? Um, is there anybody here who likes Reese's candy bars? Would anybody like this? Okay. Uh, Bill, I'll let you come down if you want to come down and, and get this. Eli, okay, Eli, come on down. Here's what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put this behind my back, and you've got to choose. All right? You've got to choose. He's either in the right or the left hand. I don't know my right and left. Oh, well, that's all right. I, I think I know my right and left. <laughs> you just say right or left, and we'll see if you get it. Right. In my right. Okay. I'm sorry. Good try. But you know, that's the way it goes sometimes. We choose right, we choose wrong. But that's not how God does it. Can I show you how God says it? God says, I put before you a choice. You can choose one or the other. Which do you choose? Yeah. Well, go for it. <laughs> Smart young man. Smart young man. <laughs> God puts a choice before his people. Look at verse 2 in chapter 13. The Lord said to Moses, Send some men to explore the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the Israelites. Does it say which I'm thinking about giving to the Israelites? Which I probably will give to the Israelites. Or most likely, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to give it to the Israelites. He says, I'm giving it to the Israelites. It's a definite statement. And so when he sends the spies in, he's just saying, check out the land I'm given. Remember when Jesus said to his disciples on the shore of the Sea of Galilee? <laughs> he said, hey guys, let's get in the boat. Let's go to the other side. And they did. They all got into the boat and they took off. Jesus is in the back asleep. They get halfway across and the storms rage and they are thinking that they're going to sink and... They wake up Jesus. What did Jesus say about their faith? Oh, you of little faith. What did Jesus say? Let's go to the other side. He didn't say, guys, let's go out halfway and we'll get in a storm and we'll sink. He said, let's go to the other side. Now, when we trust the Lord and we know where God guides, God provides, there are storms. There are those things that tempests that come up. But God said, let's go to the other side. Jesus said that. And so the Lord here is saying, I'm, let's go into the land I'm giving to the Israelites. And so their choice was to really trust the Lord or not. God said to the Israelites in the book of Deuteronomy, now choose life that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice. Hold fast to him for the Lord is your life. And he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Choose life. That's what God is saying. Choose life. He, he puts it out there. He makes it very clear 
what we can choose. Uh, Joshua, at the close of his life, said to the people of Israel, But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day who you will serve. Some of them had fallen. They're now in the promised land, and some of them had fallen into worshiping the false gods of the people in the land. But he goes, choose for yourself who you're going to serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're now living. But what, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Well, there's a chance that some of you have a plaque in your house somewhere with that written on it. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But the people of Israel only saw what they could see. They were only looking at it with their own understanding. And so they rejected God's plan. Have you ever been in a situation where someone drew a line in the sand and just dared you to step over it? Some of us guys have, probably on numerous occasions growing up with our friends. Seemed like that was the thing to do in my neighborhood. But you know, you draw that line and, and you're challenged to step over it. And you know you've got a choice. If you step over it, there's a real good chance that you're going to get in a fight and you're probably going to get a bloody nose. But you also know that if you don't choose to step over that, you're going to suffer consequences from that as well. And most of all, it would just be the painful fact of knowing that you lack the courage to face the challenge. <laughs> so God gave his people this line in the sand to cross, and they chose not to accept the challenge. Why? They had forgotten that where God guides, God provides. Well, this brings us to the consequence then. The circumstance was, as God had said, let's go into the land I'm going to give you. The choice was, they said, no, let's wait. So the consequence, there's consequences to our decisions. Consequences to sinful acts bring forth some un uncomfortable things. Consequences of just trusting what we understand as opposed to trusting the Lord also brings forth situations. Dr. David Jeremiah, he tells the story about a guy up in Seattle who uh, was going to go siphon gas out of a motorhome. Now, most of us know what it means to siphon gas. You put a hose down in the gas tank and you, you have to suck on the one end until you get it flowing. I've done it a few times and almost every time I get a mouthful of gas. I mean, you know, and it's not fun. Some of you just tasted that gas when I said that, didn't you? <laughs> Cold and everything. But anyway, you know, so he, he wanted to siphon gas from this motorhome. And then when the police showed up, he was just laying in agony on the ground. Just, oh, he was, he had, instead of putting the hose into the gas tank, he'd put it into the sewage tank. Whoops. Whoops. <laughs> there are there are consequences. <laughs> I'm sorry, that probably wasn't just for lunch, that wasn't good. <laughs> but but the consequence for not trusting God and for leaning on their own understanding caused the people of God to wander in the desert for 40 years. Isn't that interesting? The Lord himself said they will wander one year for every day they were in the land. They were there for 40 days checking it out, and so now they wander for 40 years because of the choice that they had made. They were concerned about their generation, not about the generations to come. They were concerned about that moment and not about what might be. Uh, there was a pig, and the pig was underneath an oak tree, and he was enjoying the acorns underneath that oak tree until he'd eaten them all. And he still wanted more, so he got to rooting around underneath that oak tree, getting the roots exposed. And, 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 and the crow said, Mr. Pig, I wouldn't do that. He said, don't do that. If you get those roots all exposed and everything, they're going to dry out, and that tree is going to die. Well, the pig said, oh, let it die. Who cares? As long as there's acorns. He was only thinking short-sighted, wasn't he? He was only thinking about himself in this moment instead of what could be down the road. Well, the people got what they wished for. I mean, it's true that the people in the promised land were of great size. What lay before them was a challenge. Yes, they felt like grasshoppers in their eyes and before those others. Yes, it was true that their own strength and power, they could not defeat them on their own. But God can. What was the point? 
They missed that God said, I'm giving this land to the Israelites. They got what they said in chapter 14, verse 2. They received what they asked for, basically. It says, And all the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole assembly said to them, If only we had died in Egypt or in this desert. And that's what happened. They died in the desert because they did not follow. How can we avoid going down that same path? We, I mean, myself, my family, you, your family, your, our church. How, 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 how? How can we avoid going down this same path? Well, let's learn from the history of the Israelites. That's a good place to begin. Have we learned anything from them this morning? We've seen how they again and again and again saw the hand of God, but when it came time for the challenge, they, they, they only saw what they thought they could understand. Let's learn from the history of the Israelites. Let's face the next step of faith. Let's, step, let's, tech, <laughs> let's face the next step with faith and not with fear. Let's step over the line and follow wherever God is leading. Why? Because where God guides, God provides. As we wrap this up this morning, I, I would ask this question. What is the line that God has before you right now? What is the line you know is there that needs to be stepped over? Would you ask God to have the courage to step over that line? To trust Him enough to know that where God guides, God provides? What is that line? I don't know what it is, but right now, you've thought of something that God's been challenging you about. God's been calling you to consider. God has been leading or God has been gently pushing. You need to do this. Let me encourage you to step over the line by faith. To trust the Lord. He's faithful. He will provide. Amen? Amen. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, you teach us from your word so richly and deeply. And Lord, we can learn from those in the past and their lives and see where they have been and what they have done. And Father, I pray that we learn ourselves for ourselves, for our church. Lord, what you would want us to do. Lord, thank you for these dear ones here today. Encourage them. And Father, give them the courage to step over the line you have placed before them in their own lives, in their family, whatever it would be. And by faith, Father, they would see you providing because you are the one who is guiding. In Jesus' name, amen. Our invitation hymn is found in the hymn book number 437, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Is the Lord leading you to take that step over that line? Would you take that step over that line today? If you would, you're invited. Let's stand together. We'll sing two verses. You come if God is leading you to step over that line. <laughs>